Growing a greener world is made possible in part by the 2018 Subaru Crosstrek, built in a zero landfill plant, so you can roam the earth with a lighter footprint. Subaru, proud sponsor of Growing a Greener World. I'm Joe Lample. When I created Growing a Greener World, I had one goal, to tell stories of everyday people, innovators, entrepreneurs, forward-thinking leaders, who are all, in ways both big and small, dedicated to organic gardening and farming, lightening our footprint, conserving vital resources, protecting natural habitats, making a tangible difference for us all. They're real, they're passionate, they're all around us. They're the game changers who are literally growing a greener world and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. Growing a greener world, it's more than a movement, it's our mission. It's happened to all of us. We're driving down that residential neighborhood and all of a sudden, boom, there it is, that house. The one with that yard and the one as gardeners instantly captures our attention, fires up our imagination and has us wondering who lives there? How do they get that collection of plants and how can I create some of that same wow factor in my own garden? Well, those yards are in neighborhoods everywhere. This one just happens to be in Bremerton, Washington, about an hour outside of Seattle. It's a labor of love, 20 years in the making, created by a career educator with a passion for horticulture. And while you might think such a garden is above your skill level, according to the gardener of this landscape, it all comes down to just seven basic principles that can have gardens of any size looking way more attractive and be far more sustainable. Well, professionally, I'm involved with medical research. Uh, for, for many years, my focus has been the role of fat metabolism and atherosclerosis and heart disease. And my new interest has been the role of fat transporters in the brain and how they could affect a potential role in dementia and Alzheimer's. While his job was keeping this professor of medicine in a research lab, John Albers found a hobby where he could get his hands dirty. Well, I, just, I started taking classes uh, in horticulture, uh, usually one class a year. Most of the horticulture classes that were available I took at the University of Washington. And in addition to get more practical knowledge, I also attended horticulture classes at the community college in Seattle. So we did both of those things for a number of years to get uh, more formal experience. And I remember, still remember the class at the community college, the instructor said, well, John, it's a beautiful day. I'd like to go play golf. Would you take care of the class for me? And so that started my teaching uh, experience in horticulture. And so one of my focuses in the garden is to teach the general public uh, how to do uh, sustainable uh, practices and create and maintain sustainable gardens. John used his own four-acre landscape as a testing grounds, a place to perfect his gardening techniques with a seemingly endless list of plants he's collected. 20 years later, there are 15 unique garden areas on display, each with its own distinct theme, and over a thousand different species and cultivars represented. John opens his own yard, formerly known as Albers Vista Gardens, for popular tours and workshops throughout the year, and it's become a source of inspiration for everyone who experiences it. I first met John on the eve of summer solstice about eight years ago, he had asked me to come and take a look at his garden. He needed uh, a handful of full page shots and a cover for a book that he was doing before he could send it to the publisher. So I came over to scout the garden and I ended up staying until dark and photographing the garden until the last drops of light available missed the ferry and had to drive back through Tacoma back to Seattle. Uh, I 
had no idea that this magical wonderland was here. And when I got here, I didn't want to leave. David Perry is a professional photographer who shoots a lot of gardens, but this one was special and David knew it immediately. To my mind, I see a lot of gardens that exist sort of in defiance of the piece of land that they live on. And I find very few gardens, they're kind of rare treats, when the garden has been designed in a beautiful conversation with the land that it exists on and with its surroundings. Everywhere I looked, I saw levels of thinking that went three, four, five steps beyond just pretty. It was, it was, it was like a, a living experiment that he was working on. It was also a painting with masterful brush strokes, plant combinations, and um, a fluidity to move from room to room to room. I haven't seen very many gardens that speak to me the way this one did upon our first meeting. David's photos of the garden would be an important element of John's book, titled The Northwest Garden Manifesto. It outlined how John had achieved this remarkable landscape. But more than that, the book was meant to be a teaching tool because according to John, success for any gardener, anywhere, on any size landscape, comes down to seven simple things. First, create, conserve, and protect healthy soil. Soil is the lifeblood of any thriving garden, and it's the number one thing that I focus on for everything growing under my watch. And if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. Feed the soil and let the soil feed the plants because as you add organic matter into the soil in the form of ground up leaves or shredded mulch or aged manure or whatever, it's giving all the microorganisms in the soil what they need to thrive and feed all the plants growing within it. And then the added bonus is when you add a generous layer of mulch, you're protecting the soil surface from erosion and runoff. And you're making that surface more receptive to water infiltration and retention. And then the added bonus, as the natural mulch breaks down, it's adding more organic to the soil to keep the cycle going. If you follow the first tenet of healthy soil, the second tenet comes much more easily. Maintain healthy plants. And it's abundantly clear as you walk around Albers Vista Gardens that John has this one pretty much nailed. I think diversity is the key to long-term stability in a landscape. If you look into the natural forest with a diversity of trees and ground covers, the forest uh, rejuvenates itself. And so we want to mimic that principle in our, in our landscape by creating uh, natural uh, multi-layered landscapes of a community of plants that are compatible with each other. The first step, of course, is proper planting. You want to make sure the roots are exposed to native soils, if possible, and not plant them too deep or too high, but just slightly above ground level. And uh, the second principle, of course, is to make sure that you've selected the plants properly uh, for your site. And uh, generally, if you use integrated pest management to take care of your plants, meaning you use uh, physical, cultural, and biological control first before chemical control. That way you can minimize or basically eliminate the use of, of herbicides or pesticides in the garden and maintain your healthy plants. Next, maintain healthy plants naturally. Your plants and everything in your landscape will be healthier and more sustainable when we refrain from jumping to those quick chemical fixes and allow Mother Nature the time to do what she does best. First, when plants are in their natural preferred growing environment, they automatically perform better. The mantra for that is right plant, right place. And when you combine that with great organic healthy soil and a generous layer of mulch, plants will thrive and require little if any supplemental care from us. John's third principle, conserve natural resources, especially water. John, one of the things that you talked about 
and creating a sustainable landscape is right. the importance of trying to keep water on the property yes. and reduce the runoff. And one of the ways that you do that is with creating permeable surfaces. And I love these granite pathways that you've created. Tell me about this. Right, uh, we've experimented with many different types of materials and we found that uh, one of the best uh, materials to use to have uh, easy walkable path at the same time that's permeable right. is the use of Canadian granite dust uh, which holds up for many years, uh, does not grow reeds and allows <laughs> the rain to seep into the soil and stay on site. I love it and I especially love the sound that it makes underfoot too. That's an added bonus. No yes. extra charge yes. for that, right? That's right. And then here we are at the rain garden, and that's something that is just so gorgeous right now. The pollinators are going nuts right. over all your beautiful yes. flowers. But the rain yeah. garden is receiving all of these pipes that you've installed from right. the gutters and right. rain barrels and things, I guess. Right. Well, all the water from the roof and the, and the foundation of the building uh, comes down to a site on the other part of the garden and is brought over here uh, through perforated uh, piping and then seeps into the soil. Any excess water that doesn't go in the soil on its way will go into the rain garden and stay on site. Well, the plants seem incredibly happy here, and the beauty of that is, in selecting the right plants, is that they can handle very wet feet for yes. a period of time, That's temporarily, correct. Yes. and then dry the rest of the time. That's correct. Even if you harvest the rainwater that falls on your property, most of us also need to consider supplemental irrigation. Wherever you water, you want it to go just where you need it and nowhere else. I like to do that with soaker hoses, emitter tubing, and drip irrigation. That's what I use all around my garden, and it works so well to deliver a precise amount of water right where you want it and nowhere else. And I'm in the midst of doing that right now in between seasons using emitter tubings here in my raised bed gardens. And when you pair those with an automatic timer, it is the perfect combination. And another simple thing you can do anywhere in your landscape is to group plants that have similar water needs together through a concept known as hydrozoning. But anything that we can do to save water is a great and important step to conserving natural resources. Because drop by drop, it all adds up. Speaking of water, another reason to use it sparingly is to avoid runoff to protect water quality. And that's another one of the important tenets to creating a sustainable landscape. Because as water moves across your property, it's always seeking its lowest level towards an aquifer or a watershed. And it takes with it all those harmful sediments like garden chemicals, fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides. And we don't want that. And the best way to reduce the chances of that happening is to reduce your use of chemicals or even eliminate that. And when you do water, keep the watering on target. Because when water hits an impervious surface, that's the fastest way for that water to get to that watershed and take with it all those harmful chemicals that can lead to water pollution and harm the wildlife, not only in the water, but out of it as well. The fifth principle of John Albers Northwest Garden Manifesto is to protect and enhance wildlife habitats. Now wildlife includes uh, not just the larger animals, but also the smaller animals and even the organisms in the soil. All this is part of biodiversity that you want to protect. And part of that, I think, picture is attracting pollinators to make sure that you have something for pollinators through all seasons. So you want something flowering uh, spring, winter, and, and fall, and summer, all, all seasons, particularly in the growing season. And then making sure that you have food, uh, shelter, and uh, nesting sites for the wildlife. And obviously, by having a diversity of plants and wildflowers, you allow the wildlife to have their food and shelter that they need and also their nesting sites. So really, your plant selection is key to enhancing a wildlife.
David Perry, the photographer who collaborated with John on his book, is a talented gardener in his own right. And it was this fifth tenet of the manifesto, enhancing wildlife habitats, that first came to mind when I visited his front yard. David, I'm pulling up to your property this morning. It was so fun as we approached. I could tell a gardener lived here. Here you are in an urban lot where most people feel like they've got to have lawn, even on a small size property. And I suspect maybe you had a lawn at one point too, right? Well, yeah, my, my neighbors weren't quite so sure when I first ripped it all out, uh, but they've all come around and we all seem to benefit. And I can't tell you the number of people that walk by and say how happy it makes them every time they walk through here because there's always something to look at, always something to stop and smell. And visually, there's so much texture, there's so much going on, and it is a constant source of food for the birds in the neighborhood. It now is an insect haven. There are all kinds of plants with nectar that create sort of a, a, a jumble of activity uh, insect-wise, and then that brings in the birds. Yeah. I grow plants that will create havens for insects. Like uh, one of the things that I do is I plant carrots in the spring that are already grown because the second year they create seed heads. So they don't, we're not, you know, I, I mean, I will grow carrots to eat sometimes, but I, I will go to the, the farmer's market and I'll buy 10 pounds of organic carrots and I will plant them and they will then grow Queen Anne's lace, which is a perfect thing for pollinators. And that provides a food source and a resting source for the place, you know, because you'll see they're always kind of peppered yeah. with little insects. And so the birds really take care of all of my insect problems. I don't have to spray for anything. It takes kind of a bold move to rip that lawn out and then put those plants in, but the benefit that not only you are getting, but all that wildlife is amazing. By doing away with his lawn, David also fell a little more in line with the sixth rule of John's Sustainable Garden Manifesto, conserve energy. There are an extensive amount of landscape equipment that historically have used uh, gasoline engines, uh, such as lawn mowers and uh, grass cutters and trimmers. There's actually millions and millions of pounds of pollutants produced by gasoline lawnmowers in this country, for example. But the gas and oil that powers our lawn equipment isn't the only massive waste of resources. And fertilizer is a classic example. It takes a tremendous amount of energy to produce uh, fertilizer. And so if you don't use fertilizer, obviously uh, you can use a more sustainable practice uh, by using compost that you produce on site. And that's something that we do here in our garden. We take all our, uh, both garden waste and uh, kitchen waste and produce about 20 yards of compost on site and then use that and put that back into the soil. And so that really conserves the energy needed to produce fertilizer because the compost improves the soil where fertilizer is no longer necessary to be added to the soil. So the basic principle is that we feed the soil organism with compost and they take care of feeding the plants and that uh, reduces the need for fertilizer then. You know, as gardeners and weekend warriors, as we create and maintain all these beautiful spaces, we do a lot of not so pretty things in the process beyond just reaching for extra pesticides or herbicides or unnecessary fertilizer. When we reach for that blower or that mower to maintain our landscapes, you know, we have other options for that too, such as electric or rechargeable options or when we're going to make that next purchase. Consider those choices as well, or even go one step further and take the manual route. Not only is it better for the environment, but it's better for us too. And finally, perhaps the best thing we can do for our gardens to make them healthier is to use sustainable methods in the process. When we make our own compost, the ingredients we use to do so are usually items that would otherwise be thrown away into the landfill. 
So while we're diverting what many consider to be trash, we gardeners know that those same ingredients are gold for the garden in the form of finished compost. That same waste as paper and cardboard, food scraps and yard debris is what we can use to make the best homemade soil amendment that's better than anything we can buy. So not only are you giving everything in your landscape the best thing under the sun, you're doing your part for growing a greener world too. One of the things about gardens is that they are meant to be shared. And if you create this much beauty and there's not some part of you that wants other people to see it and be transformed by it, then I'm, I'm not sure who that person would be, but it's certainly not John. John very much loves to have people come and walk these paths and learn everything that they can or just be here and just take in the beauty. He is as proud as a peacock when he's got visitors, and he loves to show it off. This is not a traditional garden. This is not um, a garden that you could hire somebody to create for you. It's very much a plant collector's garden, but it's not just a plant collector's garden. There's a philosophy behind it, and there's, a, there's uh, you can see the scientist that John is in the way that he experiments with putting things together and trying to work out problems of uh, runoff water and land use and elevation change and all of these different things. So I'm constantly watching him experiment and try to figure out a better way, which, which makes him a really great storyteller for telling other people because he's actually doing it. In order for us to do something about climate change, uh, about the increase in CO2 and all its consequences, we need to uh, do a better job of, of stopping the degradation of the environment and actually see if we can slowly reverse this process uh, by increasing the biodiversity of our urban gardens and our urban environment. We wanted to make a book that was accessible to people that don't have time to take lots of classes, that people that maybe didn't grow up gardening, that uh, are kind of new to the idea, that would like to introduce their kids to it. So we specifically tried not to dumb it down, but to make it understandable and not intimidating. We're trying to make somewhat complicated garden knowledge accessible to people who aren't that complicated and who don't have time to be. They just want to grow something beautiful and they want to be part of a solution instead of part of the problem. And by following these seven principles, we can uh, make a major contribution to Im improve the urban environment. And to go one step further, I feel strongly that it can improve the health of those participating in this process. And so it really relate, goes back to my interest in in health and helping people uh, live healthier and more enjoyable lives if they participate in gardening uh, the right way. Seven basic principles, none of them overly complicated, and they're the kind of little things that you and I probably do every day. But when you take them and add them all together and use them as the manifesto in your own personal garden, well, the benefits can be amazing, and the health and beauty of your landscape can benefit too. Plus, you're taking a huge step to growing a greener world. And if you'd like to learn more about the Northwest Garden Manifesto or Albers Vista Gardens, well, we have that information on our website under the show notes for this episode. And the website address, that's the same as our show name. It's growingagreenerworld.com. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm Joe Lample, and we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World.